The final performance at Oahu's Ruger Theater is scheduled for this Sunday. The Diamond Head Theater Group has called the building home since 1952. It was built in the 1930s and has screened countless movies and presented hundreds of live performances. It's also been home for thousands of entertainers, both amateur and superstar alike. Future Diamond Head Theater productions will move to the larger and more modern theater that's just about uh, finished next door. The Conversations Russell Subiona got the chance to step into the time machine on one of the last tours of Ruger Theater. The original construction of the Fort Ruger Theater was in 1932 when this whole area was known as Fort Ruger. That's John Rampage, Diamond Head Theater's artistic director. He's given dozens of tours of Ruger Theater over the years, and today he's my guide. On our first stop, he has me standing in the midst of the seats. In front of me is the stage, above me, six large chandeliers glowing dimly, behind me, the old balcony. The original construction of the Fort Ruger Theater was in 1932, when this whole area was known as Fort Ruger. It was part for instructional purposes and also as a movie theater. They did make some provisions when they built it to doing live performances, but it was mostly like small USO shows or talent shows. Not much has really been altered in the interior, obviously new seats and things like that. Those six light fixtures are original from 1932. They're one of the few items in the theater that are still original. Up there, which is now where our admin offices are, that was originally a balcony. It wasn't so much a a functional balcony. They did occasionally put in seats up there when they needed to, but that was where the movie projector was. That is now where our stage manager, who is up right up there in back of that light sits, as well as the two spotlight operators. What's the seating capacity in here? About 500. Also in the late 80s, we finally started doing body mics. Up until then, the acoustics were so excellent in this theater that we really didn't use amplification. It was the old style of having to learn how to project, which actually isn't taught that much anymore, and audiences have changed now. They're so used to having a remote control to take the volume up or down. So that went up in the late 80s. And since then, we microphone almost everything. It's the audience expectation compared to what it used to be. Right in back of the proscenium where those metallic stripes are, underneath that is where the original orchestra pit was. We don't know, there is no documentation of exactly when they built the apron forward like that, but it made the original orchestra pit obsolete because it was so far back. So we have had to have our orchestra over here on the side for, I would say, 95% of our productions. Occasionally, if the script warrants it, we have had the orchestra on stage. So that's one of the great things about the new theater is the orchestra pit is going to be where it should be so they can connect better with the musical leader. Do you know what the first performance was in the theater? In this theater, no. For some reason, We have vast archives over the years, but I have not been able to find out what the first production was in this location. You're saying that Diamond Head Theater has been running for over 100 years. What can you tell me about Hawaii's relationship with theater? Well, I think one thing that's very important is that for many, many years, we didn't have mainland shows coming into Hawaii. And so theater here became very important because that was the only outlet that people had. I think theater is so important here in Honolulu because of Hawaiian tradition with hula and music. There's a connection there. There's a very strong connection. I think specifically in the kind of theater that we do, it's important to remember that even up through the 70s, nothing was live. I mean, you only got the evening news from LA if it made the plane. Most news was the day after. Television shows were a week or two weeks after. So the chance to participate as an audience member in something that was live 
was very unique and very, very special. For instance, in the 19... 19- 50s and 60s. Emma Veery, Ed Kenny, some of the top entertainers in Waikiki would do a, a show here and the curtain was at 5.30 in the afternoon so that they could do the show and then do their gig. And people came because it was live. And of course, you know, things were much slower paced back then, but it was a regular thing. People accepted it, that if you wanted to see a live show with any of those stars, you came that early. Next stop, the lobby, for a literal stroll down memory lane. The walls are covered with photos of past Diamond Head Theater performances and feature many familiar faces. These are some of my favorites. This is, of course, Bette Midler in Showboat, which she famously was fired from. Emma Veery was the star. She was in the ensemble with this very small part. It was supposed to be New Year's Eve, and she decided to enlarge her ensemble persona, and they fired her. The next day, they rehired her with the warning to never do it again, that it was unprofessional to be stealing the spotlight from the star. And I only say it because she herself told that story on the air. And she said she did learn. That's how she started to learn how to be a professional. This is actually, I think, the most interesting picture in the gallery because it's from The Sound of Music. This was the very first production we did of it. And what's very interesting is this lady is actually the youngest Von Trapp child. They used their last names in the play, but they changed their first names. She happened to be living here in Honolulu at the time they did this, and she came in as a sort of technical director talking to them about how life was with their father, explaining that in actuality, they escaped Austria in a totally different route rather than climbing every mountain, (laughs) because if they had gone that way, they would have walked right into the Nazis. They actually went the other way into Italy. This is a very interesting part of our history, Loretta Oblis Sayer. This is the only original musical we have done in my 20, almost seven years. It was commissioned through Lee Cataluna, and Loretta was cast in the show as the lead. We were in rehearsal up here when I was contacted by the musical director for Lincoln Center, where they were casting the revival of South Pacific, and they wanted a truly Pacific Islander, which they were unable to find on the mainland, and they thought maybe coming to Hawaii. So we had uh, help set up their auditions downstairs. We were rehearsing with Loretta, and she said, no, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go. I've gotta concentrate on this. And the musical director at the time, Donald Yap, started playing Bali High, and he said, you are going to go downstairs and you are going to do the best audition you can. She did. They loved her, they hired her, they took her to Broadway. She was nominated for a Tony Award. So it was wonderful to to see the path that she took from being at our theater to starring on Broadway. And then my mic stopped working. I checked my connections, I checked the battery, I checked the setting on my recorder. Initially, I couldn't figure it out. John and I walked back into the theater and up onto the stage. I double-checked everything, and to my surprise, it was all working normally. John told me, it might not have been my equipment. Oh right, theater ghosts. Little tricks, but nothing to really scare anyone. And we were just saying the other day, we wondered if they were gonna move to the new theater, or if they were gonna stay here. (laughs) Can you tell me again about some of the experiences that... Well, you know the light that's kept on at night is called the ghost light. And it's so that the first person in the morning has light, but it's also supposed to be there for, you know, to attract the ghosts or keep the ghosts. The ones that we have here in the theater, we've never really been able to identify, although several people over the years have seen my late mother, especially up on the second level watching the show. We know they're here. They, they've always been very warm and embracing. They're not scary ghosts, but they, they do take care of us. We respect them 
If you talked like this on the mainland, people would think you were maybe a little, you know, crazy. But here, locally, people accept it and understand it. When they are seen or felt, they tend to be high up watching the show, watching over the show, watching over us. When I've been here by myself, usually later in the evening, you know, I have heard people talking to me that, and there's nobody in the building. But again, they're not presences that we're afraid of. They're very nurturing. The last stop on the tour, the infamous dressing rooms. Down a flight of stairs, into the underbelly of the theater, into what is affectionately known as the cave. Okay, so. This is the cave. You are technically under the stage right now. So this room typically holds 10 to 12 performers. We use it primarily as a, a ladies' dressing room because it's just up a short flight. This is the largest one in the building. It's called the cave because there is no windows or anything. Luckily, the air conditioning does come up here, but this is where the tradition started of writing your name as a remembrance of your time spent here. And as you can see, everything, the, the uh, paper towel dispenser, the light switches, the entire ceiling. I see names, I see artwork, I see titles of shows. Wow, wow, and literally covering the ceiling, the walls, air ducts, the trim around the mirrors. Wow, everything. I mean, there's very little room to put more up there. I mean, it's... And as I said, more than anything else, this is going to be hard to say goodbye to because this can't ever be recreated. It's not glamorous, but it's definitely unique. Yeah, unique, full of memories. And very crowded. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine this room with 12 to 14 women in it? Yeah. I mean, as you can see, with wigs, with shoe changes, with costumes, it's tight, but it actually creates a family. Mm -hmm kind of sentiment is there about having to leave this theater? Oh, especially for those of us who have worked here a long time. This is our home. This is not a nine to five job. And everybody who has been here for a long period of time, it's because they are so invested in this building. And, and quite honestly, we did look at the difference between building a new theater and totally remodeling the inside here. It was actually less expensive to build a new theater. It's going to be very hard to say goodbye. You know, we're, we're already moving things out. We're already, last week we had a huge dumpster out here. It's going to be very emotional, especially on October 2nd, which will be the final, final performance in this building. We're all keeping it together now because we have a job, but I think when it actually hits us on that day, it's going to be very difficult, and for our audience members as well. You know, I, I over the years have heard stories about my parents went on their first date to your theater, or I have the subscription series that my grandparents bought 40 years ago and have handed down to me. You know, in addition to shows, we've had funerals on stage, we've had weddings on stage, we've had proposals on stage. So it hasn't been just a location for entertainment. It really has been part of people's lives and has brought more than just entertainment. So we're, we're sending out the word to those people about this final performance because we want the audience to be people that do have a, a really close relationship with this theater and want to say goodbye. And one of the things that we're gonna offer at that final performance is that they can write their name on the wall before it comes down, you know, just to be part of the history of this theater. That was Diamond Head Theater's artistic director, Joan Rampage, talking with HPR's Russell Subiano about the history of Ruger Theater. The building uh, is uh, supposedly going to be taken down next month with the first performance taking place in the new theater in January. Uh, again, that final performance in the Ruger Theater takes place Sunday, October 2nd. Uh, and we're told it's sold out. We'll have more information on the conversation page of our website, hawaiipublicradio.org, later today. I'm not a great romancer. I know that you're bad.